Welcome to the lecture on income determination and after this lecture we will be able to learn the following objectives aggregate demand components of aggregate demand propensity to save and consume short and long run equilibrium full employment and excess demand aggregate demand tells the quantity of goods and services demanded in an economy at a given price level in effect the aggregate demand curve is just like any other demand curve but for the sum total of all goods and services in an economy it tells the total amount that all consumers businesses and the governments are willing to spend on goods and services at different price levels the aggregate demand curve lies in a plane consisting of the price level and income or output it shows a downward slope with price level on the vertical axis and income or output on the horizontal axis as such the aggregate demand curve outlines a relationship between income or output and the price level components of aggregate demand there are four major components of aggregate demand the equation for aggregate demand y is equal to c bracket of y minus d plus i into r plus g plus nx into e minus y represent income or output minus c bracket of y minus d represent consumption as a function of disposable income defined as income less taxes disposable income is the money that consumers have left to spend after taxes and consumption captures spending by households on goods and services minus i into r represent investment as a function of the interest rate that is as the real interest rate increases investment spending falls because the cost of borrowing money increases when firms consider investment spending they routinely take into account the nominal interest rate inflation and the real interest rate g represent government spending which is predominantly unaffected by interest rates example of government spending includes salaries to government employees defense spending welfare and social security programs and foreign aid minus finally nx into e represent net exports defined as exports less import as a function of the real exchange rate where an increase in the real exchange rate decreases net exports and now we will move further and study about propensity to consume this is the change in consumption expenditure due to a change in disposable income abbreviated mpc the marginal propensity to consume is the slope of the consumption or propensity to consume line that forms the foundation for keynesian economics average propensity to consume the apc indicates the portion of income that is used for consumption expenditures the average propensity to consume is calculated by dividing consumption by income for example if household income is dollar 1 trillion and consumption is dollar 1.75 trillion giving an average consumption of 1.75 minus the apc declines due to autonomous consumption and induced consumption autonomous consumption is a dollar 1 trillion of consumption that takes place if income is zero induced consumption is increase in consumption that occurs due to an increase in income minus there is some consumption even at no income therefore apc is greater than 1 at low level of income with the increase in income consumption increases by less extent due to psychological law of consumption and hence apc falls the average propensity to consume is one of four related measures the other three are average propensity to save marginal propensity to consume and marginal propensity to save average propensity to save this is the proportion of household income that is used for saving marginal propensity to consume this is the change in consumption resulting from a change in income abbreviated mpc this indicates the proportion of additional household income that is used for consumption marginal propensity to save this is a change in saving resulting from a change in income abbreviated mps this indicates the proportion of additional household income that is used for saving the multiplier is also related to the mps if for example the mps is 0.25 then 25% of extra income goes for saving this activity is critical to the macroeconomy and the study of keynesian economics 
First, the MPS captures induce a saving which one expects of the fundamental psychological law of consumer spending proposed by John Menard Keynes as a key difference between the Keynesian theory and classical economics. Second, the MPS is the slope of the saving line which makes it the foundation for Keynesian injection leakages model. Third, the MPS affects the multiplier process and affects the magnitude of the expenditure and tax multipliers. The MPS formula. The standard formula for calculating marginal propensity to save MPS is MPS is equal to change in saving by change in income. This formula has a couple of interpretations. First, it quantifies induced saving, that is, how much of each extra dollar of income is using for saving. If income changes by dollar one, then saving changes by the value of the MPS. Income induces the changes in saving at a rate measured by the MPS. Second, the MPS is actually a measure of the slope of the saving line. The measurement of slope is generally given as a rise over the run for the saving line. The rise is the change in saving and the run is the change in income. The marginal propensity to save is another term for the slope of the saving line. This can be demonstrated and illustrated using the green saving line labeled S. In the exhibit to the right, most notable, the saving line is positively slope, indicating that greater levels of income generate greater saving by the household sector. The saving line reflects a plot of the numbers in the saving schedule as well as the following saving function. S equal to minus 1 plus 0.25Y. As specified by the saving function, the slope of this saving line is equal to 0.25. This slope value indicates that each dollar one change in income induces a dollar 0.25 change in saving. Multiplier. The multiplier measures the magnified change in aggregate production gross domestic product resulting from a change in an autonomous variable such as investment expenditure. This connection between the multiplier process and the marginal propensity to save is illustrated in the standard formula for basic expenditure multiplier. Expenditure multiplier is equal to 1 divided by MPS. A decrease in the marginal propensity to save reduces the value of the dominator on the right hand side of the equation which then increases the overall value of the fraction and thus the size of the multiplier. For example, a marginal propensity to save of 0.25 result in a multiplier of 4. In contrast, a smaller marginal propensity to save of 0.2 result in a larger multiplier of 5. Other marginals. Here are a few of the more important marginals. Marginal propensity to consume. It indicates the change in consumption resulting from a change in income. In fact, if the MPC and MPS are calculated based on after-tax disposal income, then the two marginal sums to 1, MPC plus MPS is equal to 1. Marginal Propensity The marginal propensity to invest MPI is the change in investment induced by a change in income. The induced change in investment is not nearly as big as saving, but it does affect the slope of the aggregate expenditure line and the size of the multiplier. Marginal propensity for government purchases. The marginal propensity for government purchases, MPG, is a change in government purchases induced by a change in income. The induced change in government purchases is related to the induced change in tax collection and while it also small compared to saving but it too affects the slope of the aggregate expenditure line and the size of the multiplier. Marginal propensity to import. The marginal propensity to import MPM is the change in imports induced by a change in income. The induced change in imports is closely connected to the marginal propensity to save, that is, a portion of saving is actually used to purchase imports, which is reflected the marginal propensity to import. Average propensity to save. The marginal propensity to save is one of two measures of the relation between saving and income. The other is average propensity to save APS. Average propensity to save is the proportion of household income used for saving. It is found by dividing saving by income. The formula for calculating average propensity to save APS looks a lot like that for the MPS but with important differences saving APS income is equal to saving divided by income. After studying the above concept, it will be easy for you to understand the concept of equilibrium, 
short run equilibrium. In a competitive market, price is fixed and given for an individual firm. Moreover, every firm should earn only normal profit as included in its average cost of production. This leaves us with three possibilities. In equilibrium, with MR is equal to MC, either number one, AR is greater than AC equal to super normal profits. Its average cost curve AC1 passes from below the MR is equal to AR curve. The point E1 marks its equilibrium position where MR is equal to MC. The firm produces Q1 output. The total revenue of the firm is then. Similarly, the total cost of producing this output is TC is equal to output into average cost is equal to OQ1 into Q1C1 is equal to OQ1C1 R1. Therefore, profit is equal to TR minus TC equal to OQ1E 1P minus OQ1F 1R equal to R1C1 E 1P. This is the super normal profit of the firm. Number two. AR lesser than AC equal to subnormal profits. The second firm with AC2 as its average cost curve is a less efficient firm. Its average cost curve passes from above the MR equal to AR curve. In an equilibrium point E2, we find MR is equal to MC and output level is Q2. For this output level, the firm received total revenue as TR is equal to output price equal to OQ2E2P. Total cost of the firm in equilibrium is TC is equal to output AC equal to OQ2C2R2. Hence, profits of the firms are OQ2C2P minus OQ2C2R2 is equal to minus PE2C2R2 which are negative or subnormal profits. This is because the area of total cost is larger than the area of total profits for the second firm. Number three, AR is equal to AC is equal to normal profits. Finally, there is a third firm with optimum efficiency. In this case, AC3, the average cost curve of the firm is neither above nor below the MR is equal to AR curve. The two are just tangential at point E3. The marginal cost curve also passes from this point and hence MR is equal to MC. Equilibrium output is Q3. For this output level, both total revenue and total cost are equal. Hence, profits of the firm are zero. TR is equal to TC equal to OQ3E3P. TR minus TC equal to profits equal to zero. The firm is therefore making only normal profit. Note that in the case of an optimum firm in equilibrium, not only MR is equal to MC but also AR is equal to AC. Hence, in the long run, full equilibrium condition of a competitive market is that all firms should be of optimum efficiency and should make only normal profits. I hope you understood this concept that I just explained. Now we will move. Hello Fiona, can I explain any economic concepts? Professor Siegfried, can you explain the phenomena of economic decoupling? Well Fiona. Economic decoupling relates to the reality today, that we are not creating enough jobs. The productivity growth and employment growth started to decouple in 2000. After decades of positive productivity and jobs growth. What is causing this decoupling? It cannot be explained purely by the impact of globalization, offshoring, tax and policy changes. The big driver of decoupling are technological advances and progress propelled by digital mobile devices, robots that are replacing less educated workers. For example, Kiva industrial robots are replacing routine warehouse jobs. They have the ability to pick and pack products 24 hours a day with no downtime or sick days. Moore's Law will continue to be self-fulfilling prophecy with computers becoming drastically cheaper and more powerful over time. Digital labor will be become cheaper than human labor in both developing and developed nations. Second, technologies will continue to advance in power, capacity and their ability to do even more advanced tasks. They can already drive cars in traffic, replicate human speech, and beat the best human chess players. 
Over the last two years digital progress has surprised many experts in technology. Computers are assisting in digital progress in the areas of advanced digital programming and big data analysis in solving complex problems. The implications for work will be profound. As quoted by venture capitalist Mark Anderson, the spread of computers and the Internet will put jobs into two categories. People who tell computers what to do and people who are told by computers what to do. Sadly, only one of these jobs will be well paid. To conclude the economic decoupling will continue as further advances in digital technologies will deliver lower prices, improved quality and deliver expanded consumer choice and hopefully a better life. However, as technology races ahead it leaves some people behind. This will require a total rethink of our education system, reskilling workers and encouraging entrepreneurs to invent, invest and develop new products, services and industries. Thanks Professor, for explaining economic decoupling. Now we will move further and study about full employment, a situation in which all available labor resources are being used in the most economically efficient way. Full employment embodies the highest amount of skilled and unskilled labor that could be employed within an economy at any given time. The remaining unemployment is frictional measures of full employment, minimum unemployment approach, the measures discussed in this all define full employment as existing when unemployment is at a minimum. This minimum is determined historically it is the lowest unemployment previously reached, minimum total unemployment, a series is obtained from the monthly sample survey of the labor force taken from one week in each month. Those counted as unemployed are those who did not work at all during the survey week and were looking for work. It also included as unemployment are person who would have been looking for work except that they were temporarily ill. They expected to return to a job from which they had been laid off for an indefinite period or they believe no work was available in their line of work or in the community. Type of unemployment voluntary versus involuntary unemployment unemployment due to people willingly leaving previous jobs and now looking for new ones and involuntary unemployment unemployment due to people getting laid off or fired from their previous jobs and needing to find work elsewhere frictional unemployment Frictional unemployment is unemployment that occurs because it takes workers some time to move from one job to another. During this time, the individual is considered to be unemployment. Cyclical unemployment. It is probably not surprising that unemployment is higher during recessions and depressions and lower during periods of high economic growth. Because of this, economists have coined the term cyclical unemployment to describe the unemployment associated with business cycles occurring in the economy. Structural unemployment. One way is that structural unemployment occurs because some labor markets have more workers than there are jobs available and for some reason wages do not decrease to bring the markets into equilibrium. Another way to think about structural unemployment is that structural unemployment results when workers possess skills that are not in high demand in the market marketplace and lack skills that are in high demand. Seasonal unemployment. It can be thought of as a form of structural unemployment mainly because the skills of the seasonal employees are not needed in certain labor markets for at least some part of the year. The concept of excess demand can be understood better with the help of an example. This diagram is going to look at excess supply and excess demand and how understanding these concepts help us to understand how we arrive at the equilibrium price. If you're not sure about supply, demand or equilibrium, you should watch the videos on those topics. The interaction of supply and demand gives us an equilibrium price of P1 and an equilibrium quantity of Q1. We can see how we can arrive there. If the price was not equal to P1, for example, if it was P2. Because the price is so high, businesses would want to supply more of this product. In this case, they would be willing to supply Q2. Because the price is this high, consumers won't want to buy that many. They would only want to, supply, to 
uh, demand Q3. We end up with what we call an excess of supply. This is how much the supply is greater than the demand for the product. In real life for a business, this looks like too much stock on their floor. They have Q3, Q2 products uh, on, on for sale, but only Q3 of them are being sold. Because businesses need to sell their product, they will decrease the price. If they decrease their price down to P3, they will still have an excess supply. They'll still have too much stock on the stock floor and they'll keep on reducing the price. This will continue until they reach equilibrium at P1. If the price was lower than P1, so now we're going to make our, equal, our price P2 lower than P1. Because the price is so low, consumers want to buy more of it. The demand for this product will be at Q2. Because there isn't much money to be made out of selling this product, businesses won't want to supply that many. In this case, they supply Q3. This now gives us an excess of demand. There is too much demand for this product. Consumers are demanding Q2, but businesses are only selling Q3. In real life, this looks like a business making Q3 products and then selling them all out. They'll see that this, this, price, this product is popular, and as a result, they will increase the price. This is because the motive of a business is always to maximise their profits. If they were to increase their price to P3, there would still be an excess demand. This would still mean they have uh, too many, their products being sold out too quickly. And seeing the opportunity for more profit, the business will increase their price again. And this will continue until they arrive at P1. So whether the business sets their price above the equilibrium or below the equilibrium, we can see that the forces of excess supply and excess demand will drive the price until it reaches its equilibrium point. The price is represented on the vertical axis, the amount is given on the horizontal axis, market demand for childcare curve DD depicts the demanded at each price. This curve is downward sloping indicating that as the price increases the amount declines. The market supply represents the minimum price at which supply is there. This curve is upward sloping because higher prices are needed to attract additional providers into the market. As the price goes up, the supply also increases. Difference between deficient demand and excess demand. Deficient demand and excess demand can be distinguished from each other in the following manner. Deficient demand is a situation which occurs due to excess of aggregate supply of output over the aggregate demand for output at the level of full employment. On the other hand, excess demand is a situation which occurs due to excess of aggregate demand for output over the supply of output at the level of full employment. Deficient demand generates a deflationary gap, but excess demand generates inflationary gap. Deficient demand leads to a fall in output, employment and price level, but excess demand leads only to an increase in the price level. Between the two excess demand and deficient demand, the latter is worse. Measuring excess demand and its impact on inflation. Excess demand for goods and services Excess demand for goods and services is a key determinant of inflation and the output gap. As a proxy for excess demand plays a central role in inflation, models methods of determining the output gap fall into two categories. The univariate statistical procedures include a linear trend or segmented linear trend, a moving average filter, a hot rig Prescott filter, a cubic spline, a kernel smoother, a beverage Nelson filter, band pass filters, and universe unobserved components models. These methods essentially detrend output by smoothing through actual output to give a trend output series. Multivariate methods include common factor models, structural VARs, 
real business cycle models and the production function method. This paper focuses on the production function approach deriving an estimate of the output gap from a dynamic production function in which unobserved total factor productivity is modeled as a random work with drift. Dynamic production function. The production function PF is a static and co-integrating concept, hence a standard growth accounting framework should be sufficient. However, the presence of substantial measurement errors in K, N, N, A imply that a stable relationship may be difficult to identify. Havel more highlights the problem of measurement errors by distinguishing between the Latin variables identified in economic theory, the correctly measured empirical counterparts, and the actual data available which contains substantial measurement error. Moving towards the last topic in this chapter, we will study about importance of government expenditure in determining changes in the level of national income. National income comprises the value of all goods and services produced over a given year, usually a year, within a country which is representing the standard of living. Government expenditure is one of the components of the equation for calculating national income is y is equal to c plus i plus g plus x minus m. Government expenditure can increase the national income in several ways and some of them are investment of education by improving the level of education, the amount of skilled workforce and products will increase as well as which means the productivity is climbing to a higher level. Manufacturers' productivity will improve, which means there are more goods and services are produced to meet customers' demand, consequently increase national income. Healthcare expenditures. Government also inject money in healthcare, which is closely related to workers and productivity as well. It is essential that government put plenty of money in healthcare to ensure the productivity and maintain the living standard. Only by the health condition of workers be guaranteed can the productivity keep stable and increases. Defense government can also invest in defense, which is the necessary part of a country. The social security of a country is a condition and foundation of all the economic activities processing. It provides economic growth, a peace and stable situation. Most important of all will be the multiplier effect, which means an increase in spending produces an increase in national income and consumption greater than the initial amount spent. This is because the original increase in any component of the equation will not only stay in that stage or that amount in terms of national income. Since then, a small amount of increase in government expenditure will stimulate a greater increase in the national income which allowed government spending making a big difference in raising national income. Let us summarize the lecture. Aggregate demand tells the quantity of goods and services demanded in an economy at a given price level. In effect, the aggregate demand curve is just like any other demand curve but for the sum total of all goods and services in an economy. It tells the total amount that all consumer businesses and the government are willing to spend on goods and services at different price levels. Components of aggregate demand are consumption, income, government, expenditure and net exports. Propensity to consume is the change in consumption due to change in disposable income. Propensity to save is a change in saving due to change in income. When TR is more than TC, firms have super normal profits. With TR is equal to TC, firms have normal profits. With TR less than TC, firms incur losses. Excess demand is the excess of quantity demanded over quantity supplied.